Hi guys, welcome to my first video. Uh, it's going to be a very basic video on FSX on how to get a 172 uh, Cessna 172 off the ground. Um, what I'm going to do is is basically do some videos uh, as a collection, either as a collection of tutorials in relation to flying uh, or in relation to particular aircraft. So this is the first of um, what's hopefully going to be a fairly substantial list uh, to help you guys out, particularly if you're beginners or starting out with FSX. Um, some of it is also applicable to X-Plane 10, uh, I've just bought that myself and uh, it's a very good simulator. Slightly more complex to get into than FSX, um, it's a bit uh, more uh, in-depth in terms of the flying models but uh, certainly it's enjoyable nonetheless. This is going to be a very basic introduction as to uh, how to leap airborne and join the clouds and the uh, gods of the skies um, and as a result it's not going to go into too much depth into a, a great sort of intriguing look at uh, everything it's just literally going to get us off the ground so what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at uh, some of the bits of the plane we're going to have a look at how to get it into the air and then some basic maneuvering after that um, just a quick bit on the settings I use um, I use uh, in this standard FSX aircraft for these tutorials that means that anybody who's got FSX has access to exactly the same aircraft with exactly the same performance I haven't got a monster rig, I've got a fairly bog standard PC, middle of the range. Uh, obviously with FSX it's a very demanding program so uh, my realism settings aren't going to uh, leave people gobsmacked going wow look at how good that is. Um, but they're good enough for what we're going to do here um, and they certainly add enough realism for us to uh, feel that we are flying an aircraft. Um, I'm pretty much going to use standard aircraft as I said um, for the fact that anyone can then copy the flight. Uh, at their own free time. In terms of menu settings there are a couple of settings that I need to mention. The first one is the realism sliders. If you go into the options menus and then realism uh, I've put the sliders all the way up to the maximum which sounds a bit um, counterintuitive for a uh, tutorial in terms of learning to fly. Uh, your initial reaction would be well surely I want it on easy to help me learn to fly. The difficulty there is it dulls down some of the responsiveness of the aircraft and dulls down some of the uh, controls and the impact that the outside environment has on the aircraft and as a result it's a bit like trying to fly it with the uh, elastic bands it's a bit too simplified uh, and it can actually make it harder long term so I have the sliders all the way to the right fully realistic and that means that the effect I get when I'm flying this plane is pretty much what I would expect to see in real life um, the next thing I though I do have. I don't have any rudder pedals unfortunately and I don't have a twist grip joystick so as a result of that FSX allows me to do a thing called auto coordination. A number of the controls need to be coordinated to achieve uh, steady safe flight uh, one of which is the rudder pedals which are down here. Now these rudder pedals need to be used in conjunction with the yoke to maintain nice steady uh, balanced turns and a balanced forwards flight. Um, because I don't have rudder pedals I've ticked the little box in the realism settings that allows me auto coordination and that means in effect I don't need to worry about these controls. The final thing in terms of settings really is that I've set myself up at Birmingham International Airport in the UK for no other reason than it's familiar to me. It's uh, not far from where I live and it's an airport that I've flown in and out of quite frequently. So. Looking at the controls, we're only going to really look at two main sections of controls. The first one is this one here in the middle, the nice big black thing, the yoke. Um, you might be using a joystick, does the same purpose as a yoke, um, but basically I can push it forwards, I can pull it back, I can turn it left, I can turn it right. And then the other control is this plunger type device here, uh, which is the throttle. Now, as I say, I've got a throttle quadrant, so I can actually move my throttle around uh, without using the keyboard. If you have to use a keyboard it's not a problem, you can use F1, F2, F3, F4 to control the throttle, so if I do that now F3 advances, F1 reduces F4, puts it fully open, F1 is fully closed and so on and so forth. So let's just have a quick look at the flying controls. Uh, as I say there's only really two we're going to use at the moment. The first one is this one at the back, the elevator, and that allows us to pitch the nose of the aircraft either up or down. So if I pull back, you can see the elevator goes up, the nose of the aircraft in flight will want to pitch up and we will want to go up and climb. If I push forward, the elevator goes down, the nose of the aircraft will then want to go down naturally and the aircraft will want to pitch down and fly back towards the ground. 
The other control we're really looking at that's visible on the outside is the ailerons, and you can see as I move them left and right, they wiggle. They operate as a pair, so if I go left, the left hand one goes up, the right hand one goes down, and vice versa. Um, it's important to note that they opposite in, operate in opposite directions. In real life, it's something that you would need to check um, that they're working in the right um, orientation. So there have been cases of aircraft that have crashed in real life where these have been connected up either wrongly um, or not at all in some cases causing uh, obviously problems and crashes in real life. So let's get back into the cockpit ready to go. Just talking through the takeoff then, there's a couple of instruments we need to know about. The first one is this one on the left which is the airspeed indicator. Uh, at the moment we're just going to concentrate on this green band here which shows the normal operating speed range of our aircraft which is in nautical miles per hour or knots. So you've got ticks that are 40, 60, 80, 100, 120 and obviously between them you've got the, the divisions. So here's the easiest section to see where you've got 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 and so on. All aircraft fly, pretty much uh, all aircraft fly with relation to speed. The speed is not your speed across the ground, it's how fast the air is passing the wings of your aircraft. The faster the air is going past, then the more lift you get. The slower the air is going past, the slower you get, uh, and the less lift you get. And ultimately, if you have too little lift, you will fall out of the sky. That's why these lines have a bottom arc to them, and they relate to the stalling speed of the aircraft. So the stalling speed of, with the green arc is somewhere down here at, uh, well, 47, 48 miles an hour, 47, 48 knots. Um, we do have secondary flying surfaces which we can use in the aircraft to help us go even slower which is the white arc but we're not going to use those today. The other controls we need to look at are the altimeter which tells us our height uh, above a set datum. The little number in the window is the air pressure and we can change that to change the datum so I can scroll it up and down to change the datum. Um, at the moment it's telling us our height above sea level um, I happen to know that Birmingham Airport is at about 340 feet above sea level, so we know that that's pretty much correct. But that instrument is linked to the one below it as well, which is the vertical speed indicator. Obviously, if you're climbing, this needle will be increasing, sweeping around the dial. But it's nice to know how fast we're climbing, so this instrument will tell us that rate of climb. Um, and it's in hundreds of feet per minute, so you've got 500 feet per minute, 1,000 feet per minute, and so on. The instrument in the middle here at the bottom is the compass or direction indicator or uh, DG, Direction Gyro, it's got a number of names. Um, in the simple elements of FSX, literally all we need to consider it as at the moment is a compass that tells us what heading we're going. So north is that way, east is over here, south is there, and west, and so on. Finally, you do have a turn coordinator here. We're not really going to have to worry about that because we've got the turn coordination uh, box ticked on, or at least I have, um, which is auto coordination. And then finally we do have an engine speed uh, gauge down here. So as I increase the throttle or open the throttle, you can see that the RPM rises. The aircraft naturally wants to roll forwards and as I close it, then you can see the throttles pull back. Um, RPM drops again and back towards the idle speed and we stop moving. Um, you may have the parking brake sec set on your aircraft as you load up. Um, if you do, then just press the full stop button and that removes the brakes. You can see it just down in the left hand corner flashing there. What we're going to do now is we're going to take off. We're going to advance the throttle fully. The RPM will rise. We'll start to see the ground move, rushing past us. Um, and then eventually what will happen is the airspeed indicator will come alive. You'll notice it doesn't even start till 40 knots. Um, so there has to be a certain amount of air going past the aircraft before it registers. And we're aiming to get to 70 knots. And once we get to 70 knots, we're going to pull back on our control column nice and firmly and positively, not yanking it, but just a nice firm positive pull and the nose of the aircraft will rise as we discussed before and then we're going to push and pull it gently to try and get this needle to stay at 70 knots. If we push it, the aircraft will go faster um, because it's not climbing up a steeper hill. If we pull it, we're telling it to go up more rapidly and the aircraft will slow down. Very similar to a go-kart, if you imagine a go-kart on a hill. When you make the go-kart go up the hill, it goes slower, and when you make it go down the hill, it goes faster. So, that's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing we need to do as we're roaring along our nice strip of runway uh, is we're going to need to use gentle control inputs, left and right. Because of the auto-coordination, we can use our yoke to do that, um, and that's going to maintain the centre line. If we didn't have auto-coordination, we would just use the rudder pedals. Um, in terms of more advanced flying, actually what you want to be able to do is you want to control the rudder and the 
uh, aileron uh, independently but for the moment we're not so worried about that. So going back to the climb, as I say what we're going to do is we're going to open our throttle, the RPM will rise, the ground will start to move and the airspeed indicator will start to indicate. You wait till it gets to about 70 knots and then we pull back steadily uh, onto our control column. We're aiming to use the pitch of the aircraft, in other words the attitude of the nose, how high up or how low it is, um, to control the speed initially at about 70 knots. Remembering our go-kart principle that if we pull back and pull the nose up the aircraft will slow down because you're trying to get it to go up the hill more rapidly and if you push forwards we've got a less steep hill so the aircraft will speed up again. So without further ado let's go through what we've just said. Throttle's coming fully open, RPM is rising, seam moving and the airspeed indicator is now alive. Go and look at where we're going. I'm going to make sure we maintain the centre line with gentle control movements on the yoke or rudder pedals if you've got them to maintain the centre line and as airspeed's pressing 60 we're looking for 70 now and there it is so we're gently but firmly going to pull back on the control column. Now we're aiming to maintain about 70 knots so what we're going to do is we're going to push and pull you can see the aircraft's nodding slightly as I try to find the attitude that matches 70 knots okay and pretty much there so as I say, if I pull backwards, I'm going to go slower. If I push forwards, I'm going to go faster. And that's all we need to worry about at the moment. We're established in the fine. Once we're uh, settled, I'm, I'm actually using the secondary control of trim just so that I can fly it nice and uh, accurately and talk to you at the same time um, because I want to use my mouse to indicate certain things as we're climbing out and as I'm controlling the aircraft. As I mentioned before, aircraft operate with relationship to uh, their airspeed, so we tend to climb at certain airspeeds, descend at certain airspeeds, and fly level at certain airspeeds. Um, what I've got here is what I would refer to as the picture. Uh, it's often called the picture. It's basically what you get as you look out the window. Um, I'm not looking at it in terms of how pretty it is, or the beautiful clouds. I'm looking at it in terms of the relationship of the horizon to my aircraft. Um, whether I appear to be level, which I'm not at the moment, just turn myself level. Whether I'm in the right attitude that I see it for climb, which at the moment I am slightly. So, uh, just trying to maintain a little bit of a turn there to stop us turning. Ah, uh, there it goes. A little bit bumpy. Um, not quite sure why that is with the weather. I've actually got the weather turned off, but there we go. Um, just giving me a little bit more of a challenge trying to control this thing then. turbulence showing there because um, we're bumping around, it might be because we've gone into the thermal layers of the clouds, just gives me a little bit more work to do, which uh, if you've got your weather settings as a nice and mild uh, cloud free day then obviously you won't have the same uh, challenges. We've just passed 2,000 feet, we spoke about our altimeter, so the big needle is hundreds of feet, the little needle is thousands, so the little needle is just past two, so just past 2,000 feet, passing 2,200 feet now. As we come around towards 2,500 feet, I'm going to level the aircraft off and I'll just, I'll just uh, mention how we do that now. With about 75 to 50 feet to go, I'm going to lower the nose of the aircraft and gently push down. And as you'll see, the vertical speed indicator beneath starts to reduce. And it's telling us that we're climbing less rapidly. So as we go down, there we go. So there is a little bit of lag in the instruments as well. So I'm going to set what I believe to be straight and level attitude which is about there and as we can see picture out the window that's my attitude my horizon where it is vertical speed indicator still showing a slight climb and the altitude is not far off where it wants to be now you can see we're increasing speed so I'm just going to reduce my throttle and bring it back to try and maintain about 100 knots okay, my, uh, my controller unfortunately has got a little bit of uh, a little bit of a sticky spot around the neutral position, so occasionally you might see me uh, lurch up and down as the controller decides it's going to just change what I'm doing without me uh, having an input. So, fairly level, I'm not going to get too carried away with it at this point, but you can see the picture has changed for straight and level at about 100 knots. You can see that the nose is quite a bit below the horizon. Uh, we've got a nice level horizon here. Um, the aircraft's turning out slightly right for a jump. OK, and uh, what we're going to do now is look at the effects of the controls of the push and pull and go to 
by that machine to descend. So, if you remember, we looked at our elevators, this uh, control round here that's on the back of the tailplane. Uh, as we push it, it goes down, if we pull it, it goes up. So, let's have a look at what happens if I push it. As I push it, nose of the aircraft goes down. Altitude starts to decrease, vertical speed indicator goes down, telling us we are going down. But also worth noting is the speed increases, just like our go-kart going rocketing down the hill. If I pull back, the opposite is going to happen. Airspeed indicator starts to go down. But more importantly, the altitude's going up, the vertical in speed indicator is showing a climb. Now you can see the airspeed starting to, to drop quite markedly. If you remember, we spoke about the speeds and the relative speeds that we're looking at. This bottom of this green line is what we call the, the stall speed. Uh, it's the minimum speed at which the aircraft could, in theory, maintain straight and level flight uh, with the full engine power and whatnot. Um, we're not going to do that. We're just going to show that as we go up, we have a reduced airspeed, increasing altimeter, vertical speed going up. And then as I push forwards, opposite effect happens, and you'll see the airspeed will start to rise very rapidly. We're going down, vertical speed is showing a descent, so I'll just level off as we get to 100 knots. Just make it there nice. So you can see I've adopted what I think is the right picture, and the funny old thing, the vertical speed indicates is about zero, the altitude is 2,500 feet, and the airspeed is just climbing itself back up to uh, 100 knots, which is where we started out. So we're going to look at turning. Turning is slightly different than a car. In a car you would turn a corner by putting your steering wheel into a set position um, and as a result of that you would expect it to go around the corner as you maintain that position. Slightly different with an aircraft in as much as our controls, uh, we can turn them left and right and what you can see as you turn them left and right is the aircraft changes but as I wiggle them left and right in a car that would have me swerving all over the road. In an aircraft it doesn't do the same sort of thing actually what it does is it changes the attitude or the position of the aircraft in relation to the outside world, our frame of reference again. So when I turn, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn into the turn using my controls. Once I get to the desired angle of bank, uh, I'm going to then release my controls and hold them or centralise them, I should say, in terms of roll. I don't want to let them go because otherwise if I'm not trimmed, I'll throw myself at the ground or towards the gods in the sky, but we don't want to do that to the moment. So, Turning my controls, the aircraft starts to roll to the left. When I get to the angle of bank I want, I then centralise my controls. You can just see the movement at the bottom of the screen. Okay, in fact, I'll just push down a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. I'm sorry, move my camera down a bit. So I want to level out, so I'm going to move my controls to the right. You can see there's a little bit of a delay, but the aircraft starts to level out, and then when I get to where I want, I centre the controls again. So going round to the right, I move my controls, the aircraft will start to roll. And as I get to where I want to be, I centre my controls and the aircraft is turning in the opposite direction. So, with that in mind, the only other thing to add is, if I move my controls and turn, but I don't do anything else, what you can see is that the nose starts to drop and the speed starts to increase. What we need to do, and we start to go down more importantly, if we're trying to maintain a level turn, so we're not climbing or descending, we need to put a little bit of back pressure on the choice and we need to pull back slightly on our controls just to stop it from climbing or descending too much. Okay, so going back the other way, centralise the controls when we're in the attitude we want. Uh, I can then apply the adequate back pressure or forward pressure to stop us from climbing or descending. And then when I get to where I want, I can roll out into the turn. Okay, so that's pretty much turning, guys. Uh, at that point, the only thing we need to uh, add into the mix, really, is the throttle. Now, the throttle has to be used in conjunction with uh, the other controls in the aircraft. So, if I want to reduce the output of the engine, the power of the engine, I bring the throttle back. Now, it's not really a surprise thing. The aircraft's going to slow down. When it slows down, it wants to go down. So if I maintain the picture, so if I look out the window and just maintain what I'm seeing in the picture, you can see from my control column, I'm having to continually pull back to try and maintain my altitude. To maintain this altitude, to stop the VSI going down, I'm having to continually pull back. And you can see I'm getting slower, the nose is getting higher, and it's becoming harder and harder to maintain that altitude. So let's put some power back on. Full power. And you can see now what's happening is the aircraft finding it easier to climb, the speed's increasing, finding it easier to maintain altitude so I can 
gradually lower the nose to maintain the altitude that I want. And then what will happen is eventually as I keep going, the aircraft wants to climb a little bit, I'll let it do that to get back to 2,500 feet. But as the speed starts to increase, ever so gradually, it's, it takes longer for the speed to increase than to decrease. So uh, it's always worth remembering that when you're coming into land, um, there is a slight lag between being able to put your input in the throttle and seeing the speed respond to it. So I'm slightly above 2,600 feet now. But as you can see, what I'm having to do now is continually put forward pressure on the controls to try and keep the nose down, to try and stop it from climbing. And each time as I do so, what is happening is that our aircraft is travelling faster and faster and faster. You can see the speeds gradually increasing. I'm still having to put forward pressure on to stop us from going too fast. Uh, sorry, to stop us defending, uh, descending. Words out there, someone stole my tongue. But as you can see, the aircraft is desperate to climb the faster it goes. I'm having to have a, a an ever uh, increasing nose down pitch, so an ever uh, lower nose attitude in order to try and maintain a straight and level. Um, I'm just letting this descend slightly. But you can see the speed is coming up. It's still in the green arc at the moment, so there's not too much to worry about. Um, quite often with a simple single engine aircraft like this you don't actually get to the point of uh, exceeding the green arc unless you're in the descent. Um, you can see Birmingham Airport's back there nicely, so what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll head back towards it. Now, in terms of combining the, uh, the controls, certainly for a landing, um, we need to be aware of our uh, attitude for descending, and we need to be aware of our uh, angle of bank for turning, we also need to be aware of our throttle. Now one of the interesting things is that when you land a light aircraft, particularly, it doesn't apply to large jets, but when you land a light aircraft, you need to get yourself to a suitable speed for the descent, which generally is going to be in an aircraft like this, between 75 and 65 knots, depending on the aircraft. Um, I don't know the exact figures for a 172, so I'm just going to use 70 knots. Um, and then what we do is we, uh, we once we've slowed down, we can go down not the same for a cruise descent, obviously in a cruise descent you're going to go slower, we want to continue cruising, but one of the things we can do is we can slow down uh, on the approach, and that means that we're not travelling across the ground so much, which is good because it means we need a shorter runway, but more importantly, it means actually the throttle is what controls our rate of descent. So I'm just going to take the power off now, and we'll see if I can actually land this thing in some form of a, a controlled crash. So one of the other things I would recommend in terms of realism settings is set it up so it does detect crashes. There's no point learning to fly an aircraft if you're not going to look at what potentially has gone wrong in your flight. Now, we're coming down quite quickly at the minute. As you can see, we've got 1,300 feet per minute rate of descent, coming down quite nicely. We've got about 800 feet to go. We are slightly high on this approach, so I'm lining us up nicely using our ailerons. Um, I'm just using our pitch. The speed's still at 100 knots, so I'm going to try and bleed quite a lot of that off. This isn't going to be a textbook landing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm not going to do it as, as you would, particularly with the numbers, but interesting to know. On the uh, side of the runway, bigger runways have things called PAPIs, Precision Approach Path Indicators, which are red and white lights. They tell you if you are too high or too low on what's known as a 3 degree glide slope, which is the angle that you would expect to be coming into the runway slightly too low there so let's put a little bit of power on. and as I said before power controls your uh, your attitude and your altitude just as much as anything else so we're back onto two reds two whites a little bit low again now as you see the speed the speed's a little bit high we're bleeding off past 60 knots a little bit high there um, and we're aiming to touch down nicely as I approach the ground I'm just going to gently flare the aircraft bring it back we are far, we are fast but we haven't got any flaps so we're at 80 knots and then we're just going to try to set it to the runway. And I haven't got any brake pedals, so I'm just going to use the full stop button just to bring the aircraft to a halt nice and the centre line. Um, I hope that's been of some use to you guys. I hope you've seen the, the basics of how to use the main primary flying controls of an aircraft. Um, and you've had some uh, fun out of watching this video. And uh, hopefully see you back on the channel soon where I'll be doing uh, more videos, hopefully about once a week. Uh, take care. Bye.